Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, of course, we'll be learning about who our guest is and what drives them. But most importantly, we'll be learning from them about how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down with Brandon Manitoba Mayor Jeff Fawcett. But before we get into that interview, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for tuning in for the last eight weeks of new episodes every single day and listening to these great municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast talking about themselves and talking about their communities. Often we forget about our municipal leaders in the national news, and I'm hoping that you're gleaming some insight from these amazing municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast and learning something about their day-to-day -day lives and their day-to-day -day work to make their communities better. So without further ado, I want to take a moment and say thank you to today's guest as well for sitting down and chatting with us. Now, on to our interview. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I want to start with sort of a generic question, but it's a question that I think is uh, the heart of what the show is about and who my guests are. And it's no, you're no exception to this. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jeff? Uh, I don't know if there's a particular uh, time or item that brought it about. Uh, I just, I, you know, I imagine most people would say their their parents sort of contributed. Uh, I was always active in our community, uh, but I'll give you a, a nuts and bolts as to probably why I'm where I, I, I am. Uh, I had, there's four boys in my family. I'm one of three brothers or four brothers. And uh, they all, the, my other three brothers moved. They've moved away. Uh, you know, we all went through university and uh, Brandon University and, uh, and then other universities too, but uh, Brandon University uh, my wife and I, uh, first started dating, uh, in grade 12. And, uh, so I, by the time I got through university, I already had business uh, in the community and, uh, you know, we made a conscious effort to say, you know what, let's just stay here. Let's just stay here and live here. We both sets of parents were here. And so, so it was a very conscious effort. Uh, you know, I could have gone with my brothers to other places, uh, and, and it was, no, let's live here. And, and there, there was also the distinction as well. I had a good cohort of friends that went through university with me that all left, you know? So they were all gone as well. Uh, and it was almost like I'd moved to Brandon right after university. And so I, I, I need to reintroduce myself to everybody because my good cohorts were gone. And, and we said, let's like, but let's not just live here. Let's really live here. Let's be part of the community as much as we can be and just like we would do that anywhere and nope. uh, yeah continue on sorry yeah so we so i just we, we just got involved and so i guess i was always involved in things i was about 20 years old or 21 when i joined our ymca board uh and then from there i just i, I think i've been on some kind of border committee my whole life um was politics in the cards for you growing up? Like, did you ever think about politics or did you ever think to yourself, I'm going to be mayor of the city of Brandon one day? Uh, no, no, uh, I, I didn't even think that a few years back, but uh, <laughs> it, it uh, I, I will, I was always aware of politics and I, and, and the nice thing about a, a city, the size of Brandon is I always knew our politicians as well. Uh, so they, they've always been approachable and that might be my sort of del delusional sense of, uh, people want to say hello to you, uh, even if they don't. And, uh, so I, I knew who they were, they weren't foreign. They, uh, they were approachable people. Um, and I think ultimately what it was is I was just involved in so many different things, uh, between our art gallery, the business community, our chamber of commerce, I was Manitoba chamber of commerce. We, uh, I was active and people eventually kept asking, why don't you get involved in civic politics? And uh, we have a part-time city councillors. And so with the businesses, it was I was able to do that. Um, and then after 12 years and a little bit of uh, arm twisting from the previous mayor and, and others, and, and then being at the right time of life, my, my two sons uh, are both in university now. Uh, so I didn't have to be uh, a dad in the same way as I, I always wanted to be. 
So timing was kind of right too, and I and I ran for mayor. But I just being involved in the community in, in any fashion, uh, people are going to ask you, would you do more? So what was it in 2010 that finally broke the camel's back and you said, okay, people are asking me and people can ask you for a long period of time. You ultimately have to say yes. You ultimately have to make that decision and put your name on the ballot. So what happened in that first uh, election in 2010 that finally sort of was the catalyst that sort of sparked to where we are right now, 13 yeah. years on council, one year as mayor to say, okay, Jeff's time is now it's, I'm going to get involved. I, I think there, there was a, a few different factors. One is, 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 is people were always asking me, even the, the current uh, counselor in our area at that time was saying, you know, we got to get you to run for council. And I kept saying, well, you know, I just live up the street from you. So like, is that what you're looking for? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and he was retiring. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was, you know, very involved in a lot of boards at that time. And uh, one of the things my wife thought is she said, you know, if, if you do end up doing that, would you be able to get off of some of those other boards? Because then the time restraints are fairly similar. And, and so that, that played a role. Um, and I think just the, my wife and I having having those discussions and just being really active. You know, we all get that time of life when you just seem to be, think you can do everything. And uh, I thought I had the businesses in a good enough spot. Um, within the first year, I found out not quite, but you make those adjustments, uh, you, you know. And uh, it, it just a lot of timing just seemed to be right. I was I was I would have been thirty nine. Um, my boys were were still young. Um, Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, two seconds. You're fifty. Fifty two. I I was gonna guess like probably 44, 45 tops. Not wow. Yeah, good, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, li I live healthy. I, genetically, you. that's the gen genetics. I, I have a hundred year old uh, grandmother that I got to write a letter to for her hundredth birthday oh. in town here, and uh, you know, and a very active uh, eighty four and seventy nine year old parents. So genetically, uh, I'm, I'm fairly blessed. Um, you have been on council for thirteen years now. One year as a uh, mayor. I, I'm assuming the role of municipal government has changed dramatically in those 13 years. What you were dealing with in 2010 are probably similar to what you're dealing with now, but probably on a larger scale. What's been the biggest change for you over the last, uh, in your tenure on municipal council in the city of Brandon? The biggest changes. Are they the issues? Uh, well, no, there's always issues. Uh, one of the things that that I, I, I kind of learned early was uh, it's always great to have a plan. You know, it's the old Mike Tyson analogy. You know, it's great to have a plan until you're punched in the face. And there's always, see, there always seems to be an event. And, and it's, so it's how do you manage events? And in 2010, I was elected in the, the fall of 2010. In my area has the river run through it and, and all that. And by early 2011, we were facing a catastrophic flood. You know, and just prior to that, during the election, we didn't talk about that. We talked about the beauty of the river and the joys of it. And and uh, and it, it, it more or less almost changed our whole uh, first term. Like it was significant. Uh, and it's 2014, we ended up with another flooding event, which, you know, derails some things. And then, of course, in the third term, I ended up with COVID. So there's always an event. Uh, but I, I think the biggest thing I, I, I've noticed is we've matured a great deal as a city. Like Brandon has made the full transition from the largest town in Manitoba to the second city in our province. You know, we have all the urban issues, we have all the, like we, you know, the, the dynamics of our province are very different from most. Uh, Winnipeg being the capital, the economic hub, demographic hub, you know, it was always, we were the other city outside of Winnipeg and not a massive one either. The, the comparisons are where we're 15th the size. Uh, you know, I can imagine, though, and I apologize for interrupt because I, I want to throw this caveat in here. That change in being the small, the largest town in this, uh, the community to the second city in the province as well brings some challenges with it as well. And oh, I, sure. 
I can imagine that that probably is a even today you're dealing with some of the ramifications of being the largest city in the sort of south. West. Western. I was going to say, I, I know it's called the Western uh, region area. And I was just trying to think of that name for a second. You're getting a lot of people, a lot of ser- people coming into your community looking for services. So you're now yeah. not just supplying services to your community, but to the surrounding communities as well. well absolutely. We like our trading areas go uh, up probably over 200,000. And, uh, and we are the service hub, you know, we have a university, a college, we have the major uh, uh, health center in the in the region. Uh, we're the retail hub. Uh, we're also the social service hub, which has become a bigger, bigger factor, sort of post COVID. Uh, but I, but, there, but but we've kind of fully transitioned. Uh, the, the makeup of the city uh, even has changed since I've been on. The last twenty years, we've seen a lot. But you know, we sixteen percent of our population is indigenous. Twenty uh, percent is. Uh, uh, immigrant, uh, you know, and a lot of that recent, you know, some of our old friends like that I grew up with and that that uh, have been here for, you know, 50 some years. <laughs> uh, they kind of really enjoy that they live in a community that is as diverse as ours now. So even just that, you know, even just that in the last uh, sort of 13 years. And, uh, but it's been really rewarding, like those are positive, but you know, we still have to realize we have urban issues, uh, we need more involvement with the provincial government. Uh, we can't be quite as self-sustaining. So our relationship with the provincial government has grown significantly as well. Okay. So you've opened Pandora's box. I want to play in that box here for a second. Yeah, I know you on. did. Uh, we were recording this the day before the new premier designate is sworn in on October 17th. Uh, he is to be sworn in with his new cabinet on the 18th. Now you've just said you're hoping for better collaboration. I know you had met with premier designate Wab Canoe earlier in October. Um, did you relay this message and can you give us a sense of what you took out of that meeting? Oh, for sure. And we will have we will have collaboration. And I don't necessarily need to say better. Uh, in, the, in the last year that I've been sort of in as mayor, uh, I have had an excellent relationship with the, the former premier and the ministers. And, uh, you know, we like very active participant, uh, which does mean myself getting to Winnipeg an awful lot to be present. But uh, it was often reciprocated. And, you know, and uh, the premier elect uh, Canoe and I have met in my own office a number of times and had uh, really good discussions. So he doesn't need to be brought up on a whole lot of things. We're we're aware, and he is conscious of the fact that, you know, his 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 government only does have uh, six seats outside of Winnipeg, which is helpful for Brandon because one of the seats outside of Winnipeg is in Brandon, if I'm not mistaken, that's Brandon right. East, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And Glenn Samard, who's a, a great guy, uh, you know, uh, because. We don't too tend to know each other out this way, uh, and people will say, "Oh, why? How come you you know all these people?" It's because uh, he's another person that's been active in the community for a long, long time. Uh, he, you run across each other, <laughs> and he's a super guy. So I hope that works well. Uh, him uh, and the other two uh, MLAs that we have in Brandon, we have the three. Uh, so the one is in government, and the two are in opposition. But the four of us all met together to talk the other day about you know what are our goals as a community. Uh, let's do the best we can to work together. Uh, let's utilize each other uh, to do things. And uh, no, I, I, I'm I'm very optimistic we'll continue that relationship. I think it is understood in Winnipeg. And uh, but, but but there's an effort that needs to be made on our part, always. Oh. I want to turn back to the role of a, uh, the council for a second before we turn yeah. to the city as a whole. And I, I like asking this question because uh, I always get a chuckle when I hear the answers. Um, I, I know that you know that you're never going to please 100% of the people in your community with any vote that you make. If you make a vote, you're going to have people upset with you, no matter what type of vote it is. Um, there's rare occasions where you might get a unanimous support, but the majority of the time you may hear some backlash. How do you balance that? How do you balance as a sort of a small town, small city mayor with understanding that the decisions you make at that council table are going to impact your residents, your neighbors, the people you see on the on a daily basis at the grocery store? Because I can imagine 
you you can't go away because you're you're kind of a hard person to miss even in a lineup of other mayors i was like who's that guy that's jeff yeah. from brandon when yeah. i was watching the amm conference so how do you balance the needs of your community understanding that you make the biggest impact the day after you make them you know i i, I always think like i'm fortunate that i for myself uh that i still have my parents in the city and I always have to try to make the best decision I can that my parents are going to understand why I had to make those decisions. And uh, is it hard? At, at times it is. For sure it is. Because, you know, our votes are not, you know, if I'm voting no, it means that I was zero. I was not in on that at all. Or if I'm voting yes, I was 100%. Like we're all our votes are, you know, I'm 65 and, and, and they're 40. And you know, like there, there isn't a hundred percent on these things. Yeah. So you know, but I, I I'm fortunate uh, that I have a very adult council. You know, they, they, they we have a, a, a there there isn't blocks on our council. Our our, our votes. There's always good debate and discussion, and uh, we get unanimous votes on 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 a number of things. You know, that are fairly uh, basic things all the time, actually on those, and but. But on, on a lot of them, we can have two fairly contentious votes on one day. And it, it might be, you know, 7-4 uh, both times with a different 4 and a different 7. You know, because we do look at the issues themselves. And, uh, you know, I, I've also been, I think, very approachable. Uh, so people do come up and talk to me all the time, and I I, I I talk to people all the time, and and as long as I can articulate, and and as a council we can articulate why we're making decisions, and uh, that's the best we can do. And some people will be upset, um, sometimes until the next item. What's it like going into the grocery store with you? Then I can imagine going in grab a carton of milk is probably a two hour ordeal for your family. <laughs> Uh, you know, I actually like it. I, I love being out. Uh, I, you know what? I don't even know if it is that big of a deal because I, you know, I've kind of been in public life around here for a while. Um, I, I think I have been easy to approach, uh, and and I have a great deal. Like I like people. It seems you know, like it. You you seem yeah, very I, active on social media, and you engage with people, which is very rare for a city wide councillor or even mayor to do that. Why is that so important for you to keep sort of the common touch going in municipal politics? I don't know. I don't think I do it consciously. <laughs> <laughs> I but love I the think... honest answer. <laughs> I, well, actually, I, like I'm not a social media fan, and yet uh, one of the big issues we've had, and I've spoke to uh, lots of people about it, is is how do we use, uh, like how do we communicate? Uh, you know, there there was a beauty to radio, TV, television, you knew how to get your message out and everybody saw it, you know, and, and now we have more ways to get our message out than ever, but it seems like, you know, somebody gets TikTok and somebody gets into which I'm not on. I hate, I don't, I'm not on everything and I don't use them that well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> but you. even I'm... like things like you do, like, like this is great. I actually think that there probably is a lot of room on podcasts and that. Uh, I got to admit, I listened to uh, Burley and those guys and you got a little bit of that, uh, feel like it's honest and you can just have a discussion and uh, and, and uh, actually and I like that because they actually have a debate and uh, they, they can get along but debate an issue yeah we, we just try not to swear on ours we'll do our best yeah you got a seven <laughs> second on there somewhere there, I want to turn to the uh, the second segment and before I ask this question I preface it all the time even if it's the mayor I'm talking to or a counselor or a past mayor this is a conversation between the mayor and myself this is not a direction of council this is not a motion of council this is not a policy of council this is his opinion I don't know why but we get emails about this question yeah, for, sure, for sure so mayor in your opinion at the time of recording this what do you see as the biggest issue facing the city of Brandon today uh, well, I would say without question, publicly and 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 likely is the biggest issue uh, is our social service piece. Um, yeah. Brandon has a higher homeless population uh, per capita than the city of Winnipeg. Uh, we are the regional hub for all these things. Um, 
and that is where we have regular discussions uh, with the province uh, and with our MKO and SCO, which is our, our the northern and uh, southern uh, chiefs, um, it, who are all work together. So we have all those levels of government trying to to work together. Um, it's so so. There's housing in there. There's other pieces that long addiction. And so, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here because uh, I want to start this line of questioning off correctly. You're, you're talking about a lot of issues, social services, housing. That's not just a municipal issue, and you know that. I know that. I think the majority of people listening to this know that. Absolutely, we do. Until a the provincial government gets up and running, appoints new ministers, which we're recording this prior to the cabinet being sworn in, so it could change by the time this airs. Until the federal government comes in and starts helping with housing, starts helping with some of the social services that they also deal with as well, municipalities are left holding the bag. Absolutely. How are, how is the, the city of Brandon sort of adjusting to the reality that? Until the federal government and provincial governments come to the table, you're in it by yourself. Well, we have been, and and you know, and uh, and we're not in it completely alone either. And I will tell you that, like, we have a very strong uh, AMM, uh, like a Association of Manitoba Municipalities, uh, and also uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, the, the current mayor of Winnipeg, Scott Gillingham, and I, we have a, go a very good relationship. They're doing a lot of work on housing and addiction right now we are piggybacking with them we'll be working along with them and both of us have had a chance to talk with the premier elect uh how we can all work together in this so we got places up north like thompson which is kind of like us which is the, the hub up there and, and and we need to all be on the same page but but even uh mayor gillingham and i spoke the other day that we've hired staff like the, the municipality has staff that works in this field now like that's that, that, that was never our responsibility it's always the concern of trickle down and, and then, you know, but but the reality is, is there are residents, they're here. Uh, I had a good discussion the other day with uh, Grand Chief Seti uh, from uh, MKO, um, because we have a lot of people from the north that live here, and how we all work together, because they're, they're residents for all of us, and uh, how do we work together to do things. So also fortunate that the size of our community allows our social service groups to work really well together. Uh, the city is involved in that we're in the know. We try to share our information, try to work together. But uh, but they, the, our social services community and our nonprofit groups really do work well together. They're not fighting for the same dollar. They fight for each other to try to do the best. So we're very fortunate uh, in, in our communication with, with them that way. There's always one area that uh, we see we we tend to forget when we're talking about the social services aspect of this. And that's the residents. The residents buy into solving the issue. Is there buy in from the city of uh, Brandon, uh, city of Brandon's residents to say, we need to fix this. We need to uh, either get support services in the community so that way you can help people. So that way we can feel safe in our community. That way we can bring homes affordable, that we can house the people who are feeling houseless. Uh, we can deal with the mental health issues as well. Is there buy in from the residents to help us address these issues as well? There, there, there is, there is, uh, and, and sometimes there has to just be that, that little bit of an explanation that we, we, we need to do it with our other levels of government, like we can't afford to do it. And it, it does sometimes get, because we're the boots on the ground. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like, I admit, like the last couple of elections that I've ran in, and, uh, and this is probably similar for a lot of, of uh, you know, smaller cities like us, by the time it was done, I thought, okay, well, I'm not 100% sure if I just want an election for mayor or for minister of health, because everything that we dealt with was around that. And uh, so so that is one of the reasons we know. And even at the doors, it was a big concern. Um, but as as we said earlier, like that that involves us working very closely with the province and with our with our other major cities uh, to put together really good plans. Uh, is, is there a lack of understanding of the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays compared to the provincial government in Brandon? Uh, I don't know. If that's just in Brandon. I'd assume that's all. No, no, no. And I, I, I'm hearing different stories from across. Yeah, Canada. Yeah, I, I, no, hate, there, I hate, there, there I hate painting a broad stroke. Here, yeah. But, yeah, but, but for I, sure there is at times for sure there is uh, like, we you know, housing is always brought up as a, as a municipal issue. Uh, 
All you can do is change the zoning permits. Yeah, yeah. And we do have a role to play, like a significant role to play. Uh, but yeah, there is there is some, but but we also because we're we're closely connected, we 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 work with our, our provincial partners really well. Is there uh is the is is your door knock being knocked on on a daily basis for developers to build uh, housing in your community? Uh yeah, it is. Uh, that so this would be the other issue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the other yeah, issue. Yeah. The housing so, crisis it, it, is probably something that you're you've seen up close and personal, being in uh, town, being in the city, and seeing it grow as it has over the last twelve years. Oh, absolutely, and 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 it has, and and so there's there's a couple of things on that. Uh, one, housing prices um, depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking internally in the city, housing prices are too high. When we have investment from outside the city coming to look here, they love it because of the the, the affordability of housing, right? Back. So, <laughs> yeah, but then that's true because you know, like we 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 live here, so uh, house prices, you know, we. Whereas if you know you're a co company coming from uh, Alberta or uh, a European company that's looking over this way, they like they love how affordable it is. So it's a perspective. Uh, internally here, uh, yeah, the housing prices have gone up like they have anywhere, but even compared to across the country, they're not they're not that bad. So uh, what does what do you and council have to do to sort of help try to address? kind of a double-edged sword because you don't want to hurt investment by a lowering them too much well i don't think you would hurt investment by lowering housing prices too much but you you don't want to hurt the people who are relying on their housing to sort of retire in 10 15 years or 20 years or 30 years who've already put such an investment into their uh, their house uh yeah yeah and, and you know and we've just run the market like we, we you know our market is, is has run our housing uh we do need to work with the provincial and federal government, which we have been, and actually, and both of them have been very good in the last uh, year about some funding coming in uh, for for different levels of housing. Uh, that's the, the issue. Is, yeah, is it a diverse type of housing you're looking for? Or is it just like uh, affordable housing? Is it like duplexes, townhouses? What we've type of housing of are you? We've got, we've got lots of they, people. We, we so we build our our home builders build all kinds of housing we, it, it's just okay. if you go on the political or not political but on sort of the left of housing uh we we need because that is the the stuff that we've tried to talk to private sector to do but they really just can't they, they just can't do it it, it, it they, they they've done their best we've, we've got a great housing first out here and and some of them have tried to be involved in that and it doesn't work as good like we do still need our manitoba housing we we still do, do need some of these federal and provincial uh, transitional housing uh, spaces, and uh, we're we're working at that, and uh, they've been supportive in the last uh, uh, year or two about trying to create some spaces, and I think we'll be talking a lot more about that with this new government in Manitoba. You but, were elected. But, but, go, but go the ahead. other issue, the other issue though, is um, I think like a lot of communities, we've been we've been growing a lot, but we've been living off of uh, sort of nineteen sixties infrastructure. Right, so we've been putting major uh, funds, and federal and provincially have been very good about it, uh, into to upgrading things. But then also, like we, we've run ourselves to capacity on a lot of spaces. Like, uh, so we, between new lift stations, uh, uh, you know, uh, upgrades to the plants, like to continue building. So, so the, the developers are more knocking on the door, saying, you know, get this stuff in place faster. Uh, so that we can keep building more. Uh, so we're, our timeline has not been great on that. So we, we have been doing some major investments in the last number of years that will allow us to continue to, to grow. Um, but that kind of infrastructure investment really hasn't been done in a major, major way since the, probably the 60s. So you and this current council are left with that bag. You are dealing with an infrastructure crisis that a lot of municipalities are dealing with right now. Yep. Now, it's kind of a double-edged sword because you can't build houses with the current infrastructure, but you can't bring people to lower the tax base to potentially afford these infrastructure uh, projects without increase in, 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 unless you build pipelines to for water, sewage, yep. all that stuff. 
So you're left between a rock and a hard place. How do you balance that? How do you try to grow your community, not do it on the backs of your residents with the understanding that if you don't grow your community, you're going to be stagnant and you're not going to be able to bring these infrastructure projects unless you raise your taxes 10, 15% each year to sort of afford those $2 million uh, sewage upgrades, that lift station, the uh, water pipes that need to get exactly. And I'm just saying $2 million <laughs> in general, but I know, and you know that there's probably close to like 10 million for some places. Really more than 10. We, we've had some big projects on the go. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it is good. Like we, we, we've worked really hard over the last decade to get our development cost charges in place. Uh, you know, so that the new development pays for new development. It's not fully, uh, we haven't done enough, collected enough so that it, it does. So we're going to have to front end some of that. So that's been a community discussion. Uh, it will get payback over time. Uh, but also as we're looking at new industry all the time, which we, you know, people do look out this way. Of course, just the, the, the cost of, of power of Manitoba is what a lot of people like and uh, and green, uh, you know, and uh, so it works out quite good. Because you're but mostly if, hydro, right? We're all hydro. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we're good. <laughs> and uh, there's issues with that, too, but it's uh, it's issues we prefer. Like the, the fact is it's, it's a great place to be at this time in the world. So. But, but to get those, like if we don't get the development going if, so that we can get these homes in that, then we're actually going to end up driving up the prices of our own existing homes, uh, which nobody's going to like either. Uh, and uh, But but to do all that, we, we knew this was coming. So we've been working on it for a number of years, like a decade. And, uh, and it also we've created a lot more density in the last decade, like much more than we've ever done before. So regularly... We put up four-story buildings regularly now, in, in a, in a, so we have more of a European-style city than high-rise city. You know, we've got our twelve-story and uh, and a, a couple of others, and then it's you know four-story is a common uh, building now. Is Brandon similar to other municipalities? Is NIMBYism alive and well? Do people not want to see changes in those twelve-story uh, houses compared to the four, like maybe twenty years ago? You know, it isn't really that bad. It, it, it yes, it does. It does exist, um, but not as strong as some other communities, like say Winnipeg, or even in in the conversations I had in Portage La Prairie. Sorry, Sherilyn Knox. Uh, yeah, she's talking much. She's talking <laughs> she much. is. Uh, do, do, her, do, her Scott hired the Trans Canada Connection. <laughs> hey, I went through all three of your communities in August, yeah. so it's beautiful. Yeah. So, how do you deal with the NIMBYism to to make sure that you're not upsetting people enough to say well this isn't the brandon i used to i grew up in, and i need to leave our, our staff communicates very well we do lots of open houses uh we, we try to include uh, people the best we can uh, you know we're also fortunate uh, for a community our size we have a, a daily newspaper and uh, i think that that's really important that we do uh and and we have excellent journalists uh, so they do try their very best to get their, their information out there. I will qualify that a little bit. We have excellent journalists. I don't always agree with the editorials and opinion pieces, but I like the journalists. They, 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 I like the other guys too, but I don't always agree with them. But can I, so can I ask you a weird? Have, yeah, go ahead, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So, so at least on the on the on the newspaper end, we do get information out there pretty good, or at least the discussion. Uh, and, and people do know that we are approachable and our staff is very good at getting out there to get information. I want you to go back to your grade 12 self. And you talked about how you were th uh, one of four boys and your three other siblings moved away. Would that happen today in Brandon, would you say? If there was a family of four boys and they were looking, hey, do I have enough amenities to set up a business here? Do I have enough uh, resources to make a living here? Would you say that the majority of those three, four kids would stay in Brandon? Uh, the tough, the I, tough I, question. No, no, I, I think that, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for all of them to stay. There's an opportunity for all of them to stay. But the beauty of a place like Brandon is with a college and a university in a city our size, uh, it makes mobility easier. Uh, and 
my brothers being professionals, um, you know, did did marry off the other professionals in that in in, in other locations. Um, so that is that's one thing, and they probably still would. My old book club at university, uh, when 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 they left, like they all left. But you know, like if you're a physicist, there's only so many jobs for PhD physicists in Brandon. There's only so many jobs for uh, people that are reporters. And uh, my one good buddy, who was one of manager McLean's fifty most powerful people, you know, uh, a couple a year or two ago, went off to uh, Toronto. So he was with the Star for you know, 30 years instead of the Brandon Sun. So, you know, he could have been in the Brandon Sun. Uh, I'm going to give you a little little story on this, though. This is a, a, what I was sharing. My other, another friend of mine, he, he went off and he was doing his master's of law at the University of Minnesota. And I called him the one day and I said, are you, are you going to come back to Brandon or even Winnipeg? He said, oh, Jeff, I can't do that. Uh, Manitoba is where ambition goes to die. And I thought, you son of a... You know, I, like I, I live here. Like I still live here. You, you know, I still live here. And uh, we were younger than that then. And 25 years later, he's been a lawyer in Toronto for a long time. And 25 years later, he, he did give me the, you know what? I wonder sometimes if I'd have stayed in Brandon or in Manitoba, could I have done something? You know, because he, he works hard, does well rat race though. You know, probably not going to get near the mayor's office in Toronto. And he does say, you know, you meet with the prime minister, you, you know, you get involved. Like, you, you, like I wonder sometimes, could I have actually done something? And and so just, to, you know, and we might have another discussion 25 years from now, and, and maybe it just took longer for him to get to where he need, wanted to go in life. But in a place like this, you can do something. You can be involved and you can make real impacting change. Um but when you're 22, you think I can make that change in Vancouver. And maybe you can. Um, yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, I want I want to I, I ask. Go ahead. My brothers would be here or not. I don't know. So you've laid out a few issues. You've, you've talked about the social services aspect. You've talked about the... Uh, uh, infrastructure aspect. You've talked about the housing aspect of what's going on in the city. But I want to talk about something that's not just happening in the city, but across Canada, and that's the affordability crisis. And you know firsthand, because you have probably seen it up close and personal, people are struggling. People are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. And you are one level of government that people see on a regular basis. And the decisions you make at the council table impact your residents the day after you make them, whether it be budget. How hard is it to budget, particularly going into 2024, understanding that people are struggling, but you know that you have to continue to move the city forward and you have to do it in a way that doesn't impact your residents significantly? This, this is, a, this is a, a massive weight on the shoulders. Um because the reality is the situation we're in, like we're putting together a four-year budget. Uh, one of the reasons for that is we know with all our, our, our infrastructure, our water rates are increasing significantly uh, over the next number of years. Um, we have run a very, very thin budget for a long time. We are rural Manitoba. We run the ship tight, really <laughs> tight. <laughs> you know? And uh, and we know like we we've got increases coming. Um, I had uh, I was just away um, the other day with uh, uh, the the mayors of uh, Guelph and uh, Saskatoon, and we were talking about this. Charlie and Cam, Our good guys, eh? <laughs> yeah, guys. it was a really both good on guys. this previous show guests. Yeah, 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 right on. Yeah, yeah, because they're good guys, and uh, so yeah, Cam and I in particular, we're talking about like right now because they're in a bit of the same spot. We all are. Uh, so at the municipal level, like we have so much infrastructure going on, we have so many things going on that our our taxes are going to have to increase. And yet we are trying to be as conscious as possible about the general affordability. The irony is it was not a big issue in our recent provincial election. Uh, healthcare was by far and away the biggest issue. 
uh, affordability didn't seem to come up a lot, which I was very surprised by. Um, I think a lot of I, observers are pretty surprised at that one, to be honest. Yeah, Especially yeah. Me. Well, I, I, I was very curious. Uh, you know, I would have probably been bringing it up if I was uh, running it the other way, but um, but like I'm very conscious of that because we are the boots on the ground. We send out the one tax bill, uh, it, it, you know, and, and I, I am aware of it. Like I, I deal with our social service group, so our, our uh, um, uh, helping hands, which does the lunches in, in the community, and uh, Samaritan House, uh, which distributes lots of our food. Like they'll they'll tell you that you know we have like working families come in for. The Samaritan House, like they they've never experienced that, you know. Um, to, to Is this going to be the toughest budget you've worked on since your time in office? Oh, without question, and that's why we've also put together a four year uh, budget because we know that we can't solve things in a year. Uh, we need to give a good four year plan that also puts our next council, whoever may be, at least one year in with a bit of a budget idea. Uh, I, I know that other communities are doing this. Scott Gillingham was a good uh, one for me to talk to about a lot of this because he he implemented that while he was on council and then ran on a four year budget again as mayor. Um, but yeah, it is like I'm really conscious of that. Like you know, we we want to be conscious of of the what it costs people to just live here, and and at the same time, the costs of running a city have also gone up significantly, <laughs> and, and even more so because of the infrastructure we need to do. So, uh, yeah, it wears on me uh, a bit, and uh, and as you know as well as I do, like out of a, a tax dollar, we we collect eight cents of a of a dollar. So you get a lot of criticism and critiquing uh, on your eight cents of the dollar, and uh, you know federally and provincially, like they, we need to get more help from them. Uh, but we'll we'll keep we'll keep working on it. We, we but we, we have to articulate uh, really really clearly if our increases are, are what they're going into, what they're going up for, uh, and, and why. So before I move to my last segment, I am cautious of time here. I want to ask one sort of generic question, but I think it's an important one because you're coming up to one year in office as mayor. Was it has it been what you thought it was going to be like? I think I think so. I think so. Um, uh, I, I work really close with our previous mayor. Um, you were deputy mayor there for a few years, weren't you not? Oh, yeah, but I always thought that was sort of a BS. <laughs> uh, and so um, I- Every deputy out. mayor is tuning out of the show right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, you do what you can. Everybody on council is a deputy mayor yeah. for all intents and purposes. Uh, I, I have one right now in New Glendon Park who's a great, great guy. He has the most flexibility. He- the most similar to a lot of some of my thoughts and he represents the city really well all the time. So I'm very, very fortunate, but I, I always thought, you know, deputy mayor, not deputy mayor, use me as you need me. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, but it's so been, I didn't it, it, I didn't uh, okay. Yeah. It, has it been, so I'm assuming it's been challenging, but rewarding challenging because you're not dealing with the same issues on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I like that I, I, I because I, I did so that my, you know, I have different people running the businesses. I'm away from that. And I do this. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed working with the federal and provincial governments. Uh, I'm very fortunate because we have a, a good staff in here that runs the corporation. And so as a council, we oversee the corporation, but ultimately we were on to look at the whole city. Yeah. So again, I, 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 I love the activity I have with our university, our college, our health care system. We like we all work together make sure that provincially and federally we're sending the same message. Um, so I, I, I have I have enjoyed that and, and I, I am really busy, but part of that might be on me. I want to turn to my last I want to turn to my last subject here and it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I think Canadians should be doing more tourism within Canada and not going to sunny places. Not saying sunny places aren't great, but Canadians need to spend money in Canada. And I think municipalities play a role in tourism. As someone who's just visited Brandon, I feel like I just scratched the surface. I will be back in April for the AMM conference if they allow me, which hopefully they will. And hopefully we can grab a coffee while we're there. But what are some of the tourist destinations in the city of Brandon that you need people to see when they're there? Uh, well, we, we have... Uh... 
lots of things. Now, now of course, there's the, the the green space stuff because we're we're in a beautiful part of the prairie. Uh, our river bank is 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 is, is really great. Uh, we're in the process in the spring where we're going to start putting in some of the sculptures for Peter Squatsy Sculpture Garden, uh, which is a, a, a national and international uh, uh, sculpture uh, from Glenboro. Uh, but he's got stuff all over the world. And uh, so we are doing a big gardens for him. Uh, like, and there's substantial pieces of art that will be going in there, but the trail systems and that. And then just outside, uh, Sioux Valley owns a, a Grand Valley um, Park, which has got lots of Indigenous First Nation history uh, that tour through there. Just outside the city to the south, we have our, our uh, Brandon Hills, which are exceptionally good. Uh, I, I will note that I'm a bit of a runner and uh and and i was just doing an ultra marathon in golden bc and brandon had more people there than anybody but calgary edmonton and uh canmore and like wow. we were we us in toronto had the same number of people at it wow so we we like our outdoors we like to be active we like to be healthy so there is a there was a lot of uh, that so that's that that stuff which i think there is a big market for and 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 on that same page you know, if you're in Brandon, it, you're, you're half an hour to the Sand Hills in Carberry, which is unique. Uh, you're one hour north to Riding Mountain National Park, second oldest national park in the country, which is beautiful and brilliant. And you're one hour, uh, if you head south, you're at the International Peace Gardens, uh, you know, the, which borders Canada and the United States. It oh. borders it if you're in it. You're in both Canada and the United States. You can walk across the border. It's a brilliant, brilliant, beautiful peace gardens, and uh, it's massive and, uh, and, and a gorgeous place to visit. Uh, so there's that. But then the, you also have like we have our air museum, uh, which is uh, the, the Air Force Museum. We, we we did all the training uh, for World War II for the New Zealand, Australia, ourselves, uh, British. Uh, and there's the big monuments up there with over a thousand people recognized and the big uh, soldier, uh, Air Force soldier looking down on it. Um, so we do get a lot of tourism from people from Australia and New Zealand that come and they find their father or their mother in that because they were trained there. And so, of course, we have all the old planes in the hangars wow. and all that. And so it's a wonderful museum. It's, 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 it's just it's, so it's a Manitoba Star Museum. It's Manitoba. It's not. It's great up at the airport and then while you're up there you can do our our flights that they do just around the community so you can jump onto some of those old those planes and go around uh with people so that there's that we have a great art gallery in our city it's it, it, it is uh it's like a lot of things that if you're a tourist you got to go through them you got to check it out if you're local we only change every about six weeks so you, you know uh locals don't go every day all the time uh, but it is top notch. It is uh, well recognized. Lots of national, international artists uh, uh, present in there. Uh, it might be a little modern for some, but that's our mandate. Um, and then if you're into things like music and that, like Brandon University School of Music is still as good as anywhere. Uh, so we have lots of music that's played at the university all the time. Um, I'm going to ask you a weird question. I, I feel really stupid asking this question. So I've been through Brandon about four or five times, yeah. drove through, drove through twice, and I've visited once, twice since. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Doc Walker, the Ca Canadian country music group, was formed in Brandon, Manitoba, correct? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. They have a very big tie here. I think there's some portage tie in there as well. Okay, because I there's, 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 some... at, least a, there's at least a person or two that are from around here. Okay, because last time I was there, this. I remember there was this. a mural there, wasn't there? I think there was a mural in Brandon. Well, we we do have lots of murals in in the community, which a lot of people like to, but mostly downtown. Yeah, but but yeah, we have a good music history. As a matter of fact, Boy Golden uh, is is a Brandon kid. Uh, so Boy Golden, if you if you download his music, uh, his dad's my doctor, and <laughs> and he's he's in the U.S. right now. He's got great albums out. Uh, another great album. Uh, we, we've got lots of really, really good music around here, but it's all kinds of music because uh, jazz, uh, classic music at our university has been here forever and we, we it, it's top notch. Um, and of course, we have our Keystone Center, which is a big event center, you know, over 500,000 square feet under one roof, which is, you know, something we wouldn't build now. 
because we wouldn't have the money <laughs> if we didn't have it already. Uh, but it, but there's all kinds of things going on there. We're still really proud of all the agricultural stuff we do in there. Um, well, I'm looking forward to that one because I know that's where the AMM conference is. AMM, and, yeah, well, yeah, I think it's in like next month, if I'm not mistaken, in November. November, and then, November there is one. There was one and, here. So yes, all of the new here. ministers will be meeting with all the AMM people at that. Oh, like, that should be fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and just even the university and the college, it's just, they bring a lot of life. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, with those. Um, there'll probably be things I'm, I, I'm forgetting that uh, that I kind of take for granted uh, locally here. You know, we have the old dome building that is on the, the grounds of the Keystone Center, which is, I think, one of only two in the left in the country uh, that was built uh, years and years ago with their gold top domes and, and all that. And it was retrofitted years ago and it's a national state so i'm going to ask you the million dollar question now jeff because i think it's the most important question that any municipal politician ever gets and it's one that they should be easily be able to answer and that is in your opinion what makes the city of brandon such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family well i i, I think you caught it at the very end there to raise a family is it, it is uh, um, without question, as good a place as anywhere you can raise a family. So even when I spoke earlier about some of my friends that left, they started raising a family that came back. It's not a better place. Uh, it, 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 we have an exceptionally good school system. Uh, you know, we do have the university and college in here. We have uh, all kinds of sports. We've got Suzuki music for the people that are in music. We have our swimming clubs. We have all kinds of different recreation. Like it's a really good place to raise your family. Like that, that is more than anything. Um, and, and in that sense, it is, you know, as much as we might complain because we can and we should, you know, it is very affordable. Um, one of the things I love doing is, is, is visiting peers and friends in other communities that I couldn't afford to live in, but I can afford to travel to them and enjoy them a great deal and then come back. And, uh, and, and, and them with their, some of them big salaries that are just affording to live in there. Yeah bigger centers so it is a very affordable place there is a lot of opportunity uh we have close proximity to a place like winnipeg that can get all the international travel you want we do have flights out of here but not international uh and it, it, like it just it's really like i think it is for raising a family it is second to done up I, I think it is a wonderful place to raise a family jeff i want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart um I'm always impressed when I sit down and talk to municipal leaders from across Canada. And I, and I, I mean this with respect each time, but I, I sincerely say it now as well. Um, thank you for serving your community. I don't think you guys get hear, hear that enough. So thank you so much for stepping up and for being part of your community. Uh, the challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis would overwhelm the average person. So I give credit where credit's due. Councils and mayors like yourself are dealing with a lot these days. And I can only imagine the tough nights you have coming forward with the affordability crisis. So thank you for being on the front lines and helping your community out. I appreciate it very much. And I appreciate what you do, which does recognize municipalities uh, because it is a very important level of, of government. Uh, we aren't partisan governments. In most sense, we we uh, we work with whoever is in our governments all around, and uh, and, and I I believe it's the best level of government. Oh, so. I I have learned a whole new life of municipal politics since uh, changing the show, and yeah, I would own, not change it back. Own, you're in Alberta, aren't you? Uh, originally from Ontario, uh, now in Calgary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like uh, I went to school with Jody. <laughs> How small a world is this? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah she, okay. went, she, she was born, in, she was raised in Brandon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I might have to try and get her on the show again to talk about Brandon, how great it is. Yeah, yeah. I ran into her, her and uh, another friend of ours who's on the council in Victoria, Crystal Loughton, and uh, we were all talking about it in, in Toronto at the, at the FCM. And, uh, so uh, I guess we'll see you in FCM in uh, March or, yeah, in March. In, Cal in Calgary. In yeah. Calgary. So, um, Jeff, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. 
Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.